2023 was a big year of gaming for me. I grew up playing games, so my interest towards gaming kind of ebbs and flows based on what's popular in the ether and if I even feel compelled to play games. But I played a lot of games this year, and I wanted to share them with you. The types of games I enjoy include cozy, story-based games, one that you can play over the course of a weekend, maybe 20 or 30 hours, puzzle games, and stressful resource management games. This list will be in chronological order, and I'll be giving my ratings out of five stars, which is entirely subjective based on my preferences. If we have a similar interest in games, then hopefully you can find something that you would like to play too. I'll try to summarize these games to be spoiler free, but I will be giving my thoughts and opinions of the games. No promises that it's entirely spoiler free based on what you think spoilers entails of. This list also includes games across multiple consoles, including Switch, PC slash Steam Deck, and mobile games. So let's get into it. The first game on this list is Disney's Dreamlight Valley. I downloaded this game on my Switch on January 1st, and I played it over the course of a few weeks, maxing out friendship with the villagers and finishing most of their side quests. I wasn't really interested in the decorating aspect of this game, so I eventually put it down and moved on to other games. Then in September, I realized there were a few major updates and I got right back into it. I love Disney movies and getting to see the characters and their personalities shine through as they interact with other villagers is just a really cozy and fun gaming aspect. I haven't made any in-game purchases and I know there have been business decisions that have not been popular like the influence of the pay to play mechanics and the fact that future updates might not be free but if they are free I'll probably continue to play it. I give this game four stars. Next up is Tunic. This is one of those games where the less you know going into it the more enjoyable the experience will be. Tunic is a puzzle adventure game. It has a really cute art style with an isometric perspective and a beautiful music score. One of my favorites of a game so far. It has a unique game mechanic where you get a training manual with most of the pages missing. And as you explore the world and find the missing manual pages, you'll unlock new areas and discover new puzzles to play through. It really just had the right type of puzzles that tickled my brain in just the right way. I ended up keeping a physical notebook where I would solve puzzles by hand and make notes about different areas that I needed to go back and check on. I also tried my best not to look up hints or solutions online because even though the puzzles are challenging, I think the game can be completed entirely within the confines of the game. If I could forget everything about this game and play it again, I would do it in a heartbeat. I give this game five stars and it's also my favorite game of the year. Next is Fez. Riding on the coattails of my love and enjoyment of Tunic, I wanted to get lost in another puzzle game. Fez was an awesome game, but I wish I waited a while before playing it. I didn't know this, but the game has been around for over a decade and there are forums and discussions online where people are trying to solve the different puzzles and had been doing so over years before some of those solutions that came out. So needless to say, this game was much more challenging than I was expecting. I got stuck a lot, and with my patience and brain power depleted after playing Tunic, I felt much more inclined to look up solutions online, which ultimately led to me not really getting the full experience of this game. I give this game four and a half stars, but again, because I don't think I gave myself a chance to experience it wholly. Up next is Heaven's Vault. I was still craving an immersive puzzle game like Tunic, and while browsing online, I found comments about this game. You play as an archaeologist deciphering an old language, scrawled into artifacts, or scratched into walls, trying to uncover a lost history. The translation aspect is the main game mechanic, and as you progress through the story, you'll collect more passages that you can cross-reference with one another in order to find new translations. Though you can complete the game without translating everything, the completionist in me really wanted to, but it just didn't feel doable. When I got to the end of my first playthrough, I realized that there were storylines that I hadn't resolved and I started a new game. It was New Game Plus, meaning that I could keep all of the translations from my previous save and have more challenging passages to translate in the new game, but that just added to the incomplete feeling I had. I ended up not finishing my second game and just looked up playthroughs online so that I could find the missing story beats. Overall, I gave this game three stars. 
Next is Overcooked. Most people would describe this game as stressful to the point where it isn't fun anymore, but I love this game. I had only ever completed this game with my brother because we have this unspoken communication and the stamina to play through lots of levels at once. But this year, I got to play the entire game again with two of my best friends, and to my surprise, they really loved it. They aren't into games as much as I am, so I thought we would only play through the intro levels together, but over the course of a few weekly game nights, we were able to beat the entire game. It was a really special experience getting to share one of my favorite games with two people that I love, and for that reason, I have to give it five stars. Next is Potion Craft Alchemist Simulator. I got this game as one of the many potion crafting games that came out this year. Compared to those games, I think this one has a more robust potion crafting and alchemy mechanic to it. You play as the town's herbalist and villagers will come with ailments wanting to buy your potions and you craft effective ones to sell to them to make more money, to buy more ingredients, and make more potions. Making the right potions and leveling up were fun in the beginning, and it definitely gets a little bit more challenging as the game progresses. I played this on my Steam Deck, and the haptic and audio feedback was quite satisfying. However, the gameplay loop was quite repetitive, and I eventually got bored and busy and didn't end up finishing the game. Even so, I would give it three stars. Changing it up a bit, I wanted to share the two mobile games that I played this year. Now, I love a good mobile game. There has to be this right balance of addictiveness versus letting you play without the pay to play features and getting you enough time to play in one sitting before needing to wait and refill your energy or whatever the mechanics are. There are two that I really enjoyed this year. The first was Happy Clinic. This is the definition of a stressful resource management game. There are a lot of moving pieces that are happening as you work as a nurse in a hospital trying to make sure that your patients are getting the care that they need. I played this game as much as I could without paying for anything. I made it to the third hospital and eventually just got stuck and there was no way I could progress without having to buy power-ups. I give this game four stars. The other mobile game I played this year was Merge Mansion. I was in the car with my friend during a road trip and I saw her playing this game and I immediately got addicted to it too. It's one of those merging match three kind of games that allow you to decorate and upgrade your mansion with a funny storyline. There are a lot of real time in-game events and whenever my friend and I would meet up, we would update each other about how those events went. <laughs> I eventually got really burnt out from like a ridiculously long merge chain, but it was fun while it lasted. I gave this game four stars. Going back to console games, the next game I played was Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Breath of the Wild was the first Zelda game I ever played and what a game it was. I played it back in 2017 and I did all of the story beats before getting to Hyrule Castle and I got intimidated about the ending, so I just didn't finish the game. It took me a couple of years to get back into it and when I finally defeated Ganon, it was so much easier than I expected that I kind of regretted not finishing it when I could have. But the thing that got me really to love the game was watching the speedrun and challenge videos and just watching players push the physics of the game to the extreme. I have this mindset that when I get to the end of the game, I'm mentally done, even if there are other things that I could do like extra side quests or other items to collect. It's why I try to do as much of the game as possible before getting to that final leg, because I know it'll just feel like it's over for me. I loved Tears of the Kingdom, and it was really cool to get to re-explore Hyrule and find all of the ways that it had changed between Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. I give Tears of the Kingdom five stars. Next, we have Hades. Hades is a game that I didn't start playing in 2023, but actually returned to. Hades is a roguelike where you play as Zagreus, who is the son of Hades, and you're exploring the different regions of the underworld to try to escape to the surface. I love the interpretations of Greek mythology in this game, and the art style and music are just so captivating. I wanted to come back to this game after watching a couple of pro Hades players play this and looking up some better builds that I could do to make the game much more fun to play because I felt like I was just struggling taking any of the god's boons that I could get. It made it a lot more fun and allowed me to progress more in the different storylines of the characters. 
Hades gets five stars. Next on this list is Don't Starve Together, a survival adventure game where you are plopped into a world and have to fight everything that is trying to kill you. This is one of my all-time favorite games and I introduced it to my partner and we had attempted a couple of runs together before we realized it just wasn't the genre of games that he was interested in. This is definitely a stressful resource management type of game and it can be quite punishing as a new player. We ended up looking up guides and tutorials of better tips and tactics to survive our first year, but ultimately we never made it past winter, but it was fun nonetheless. As one of my favorite games, Don't Starve Together gets five stars. Next is Plate Up. Plate Up is a co-op restaurant management game, kind of similar to Overcooked, where you are serving customers as quickly as possible and trying not to turn anybody away. My friends had been raving about this game, and so my brother and I downloaded it and spent a couple of evenings trying to understand the game mechanics, which were more complex than we thought. We eventually finished a run that unlocked Endless Mode, but we didn't spend enough time figuring out all the different types of automations and eventually got tired of it. But it was really fun. I give this three stars. Up next is Minico's Night Market. I was so hyped for this game, it was such a cute concept, running a stall at a night market and getting to befriend the villagers in your small town. I downloaded the game on my Switch on launch day and I was so disappointed and frustrated because it was just not properly optimized. It had a lot of glitches and the wait times, the loading screens were so frustratingly long. The game can be quite grindy, especially in the beginning, and it's difficult to get certain resources and there are moments that you can get softlocked. I eventually found a glitch on accident where I would sell an item in my inventory and it wouldn't disappear, and so I spent an hour grinding away so that I could earn enough money to buy everything in the shops. Honestly, if I didn't find this glitch, I don't know if I would have finished the game. I really only persisted once a major story glitch had been fixed and finished the game out of spite. <laughs> I had basically passed through all of the side quests and any remaining things just to finish the storyline. If this game had been properly optimized for the Switch, if they had just waited like another month or two to just get it to be right, maybe I would have rated it higher, but based on my experience, I give this two stars. Next, we have Suica Game, a fun little addictive game, kind of like Tetris meets 2048. It's a Japanese game, suika meaning watermelon in Japanese, and the illustrations are so cute and the theme music gets stuck in my head all the time. I introduced this game to my mom, my partner's mom, and my partner's grandpa, and it was just really fun to see them try it out for the first time. I gave my Switch to my mom to let her play it, and she ended up putting 150 hours into the game. She's really close to getting double watermelon, and I'm really excited for her to do that. For Christmas, my dad got her a Switch, so she can play that on her own Switch, and I finally got my Switch back. <laughs> Suica Game gets five stars. Up next is Dave the Diver. I bought this game because of the hype, but I've really enjoyed it so far. You play as Dave, who is a scuba diver by day, then works at a sushi restaurant at night. You meet all of these interesting characters along the way who all have these very specific requests from Dave. I feel kind of bad for him because he kind of feels like a pushover, <laughs> but I'm really excited to see how the story plays out. So far, I would give it four stars. Next is We Were Here Expeditions Friendship. This is a short two-player puzzle game that I played with my brother. It's a game where each player has separate perspectives and you're dependent on communicating with each other in order to solve puzzles successfully. We spent the first evening just getting through the game and then spent a couple of nights trying to get higher scores, but inevitably fell to RNG. It was a fun way to spend a couple of nights though. I give it four stars. The last game on my list is Stardew Valley. Again, this isn't a game that I played for the first time this year. It was just a nice game to come back to. I feel like maybe once a year I have this craving to play Stardew Valley. You play as a farmer who recently inherited your grandpa's farm and you can decide to do whatever you want. You can befriend villagers, you can explore, you can farm, which as a farming simulator, it's probably one of the core mechanics. I played the original Harvest Moon on DS as a kid and loved looking up strategies online for marriage candidates and farming techniques. 
This past year, I've loved watching the 100 days challenges and I felt like I wanted to attempt it myself. Coming back to this game and setting a goal for myself has been a fun way to stay consistent and see how far I could get. That video is a work in progress, but hopefully it will come out relatively soon. I give Stardew Valley five stars. And that's everything I played in 2023. For next year, I usually don't keep a backlog of games, but there were so many good sales around Black Friday and the holiday season that I just couldn't pass some of them up. Some of the games I'm looking forward to playing next year include Outer Wilds, Dredge, God of War, and Palea. But if you have other games that you've loved or you're looking forward to, please leave them in the comments and we can share our opinions about them and hopefully they get included in next year's video. Have fun, keep playing games, and I'll see you soon. Bye!